Good morning to you and welcome to Virus, Oil and Politics, a Volatile Mix. A webinar brought to you by The H Singapore and sponsored by TD Ameritrade Singapore. With the uncertainties surrounding the US elections, COVID-19 and oil prices, how does the investment landscape look for the rest of 2020 and beyond? What does it mean for investors, regionally and globally? We are about to find out this morning as we have the industry experts today to share with us their thoughts. Before we start the webinar proper, we would like to invite the executive editor of The Age Singapore, Gula Warden, to give us her opening address. Gula, please. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining our webinar, Virus, Oil and Politics, a Volatile Mix. COVID-19 has changed the way we live, for the short term, anyway, and until a safe vaccine is found. Till then, the only cure is prevention, which means staying put in the same place, which we're, which we're doing this morning so that COVID just disappears. For a service economy such as the US, where the consumer comprises 70% of GDP, this is a problem, and not just in the US, the chilly winds of recession are being felt across the world. Unprecedented is a word used again and again in the past month. On April 9th, in another unprecedented move, and in addition to endless QE, the Federal Reserve said it will invest up to 2.3 trillion US dollars in loans for SMEs, state and local governments, as well as fund purchases of some types of junk bonds, collateralized loan obligations, and commercial mortgage-backed securities. All this combination of coordinated global monetary easing, trillions in stimulus measures, and collapse in energy prices is sufficient to spur an economic recovery? What does COVID mean for the US economy and the US market? Ideally, markets usually go up during the election year. It, they could still end higher. Our first speaker, Chris Branken, CEO of TD Ameritrade Singapore, which is the sponsor of this event, will enlighten us in his presentation, COVID-19, Recession or Re-Election? Thank you, Gula. Time to deep dive into the presentations. And should you have any questions at any time throughout the webinar today, you are welcome to ask away via the pigeonhole link that is being flashed on the screen. Now, our first speaker. He is the Chief Executive Officer at TD Ameritrade Singapore. Christopher Brankin is here to share with us the impact of the COVID-19 on the US markets. Over to you, Chris. My name is Christopher Brankin and I'm the CEO at TD Ameritrade Singapore. Welcome to the EDGE's semi-annual events. Uh, I'm calling this one the Coronavirus Edition. Uh, and I wanna say thanks to everyone for spending some time to listen to our take on the current US market's reaction to the coronavirus and the market chances of recession and why you should or should not care. So let's get right into it. You know, so wow is a word I think you hear overused a lot, uh, especially in the sports world. But, you know, wow is really how much the world has changed since Chinese New Year. Uh, it's strange to say this, but last week was the best week for U.S. stocks since 1974. And so think about that. According to many economists and, and financial pundits, you know, we're most likely headed for a global recession, and the S&P 500 is down over 15% year to date, but we've just experienced one of the best weeks for stock trading in the U.S. in 45 years. Uh, so, you know, just, you know, kind of let that sink in a little bit. I think it is, it's a crazy times in terms of what's going on around the globe. And we've seen some, a little bit of stability come back, and but still lots of volatility in the U.S. markets. So I wanna, what I want to do is to kind of give you some perception around, uh, we're going to take a look at some of the numbers pre and post coronavirus to maybe just get a better sense of the massive impact of what this ep epidemic has caused thus far. So if you look at GDP, you know, for 2020, basically from globally to developed countries emerging, everyone except Japan was a little bit negative, was saying pre-coronavirus that we were gonna see a positive GDP growth. But then all these numbers were significantly slashed 
uh, over the last six to eight, eight weeks from what has happened in terms of just global shutdown, lack of demand, you know, sh stay in place, you know, you know, whether it's, you know, different work from home mandates or, uh, you know, stay at home basically around the world has really been the mandate that has been slowing the global economies. Uh, if you look at the yield curve, uh, you know, especially, you know, the main one in the U.S., the 10-year U.S. Treasuries, you've seen it drop below 1% for the first time ever in its history. And if you look at that from the financial sector, you know, so any of these banks, brokerage houses, insurance companies that have cash on their books or lend money on margin, you know, these stocks took a significant beating here at the beginning uh, of the, over the last kind of six to eight weeks. You, know, you saw major banks in the U.S. and regional banks down 43 to 45%. You saw broker dealers down across the board. You saw insurance companies, you know, have suffered significant losses to their underlying stock price. Uh, as we saw the coronavirus kind of take hold of financial markets, especially in the financial sector, uh, over the last few weeks. And if you kind of look in the bottom right-hand corner, you know, I always like to look at these things historically. Uh, you know, we've seen since World War II, we've seen basically 15 different times where we've had a bear market. And in those 15 times where we've had a bear market, seven times there's been a recession. Uh, eight times there hasn't been a recession. And what's the difference in those is really like the average decline and the decline of the length of the decline. So if a recession happens, we see almost a decline of close to 37%. And we're, we're not a recession, it's about 24%. And then even more importantly, if you look at the length of that, you know, it's almost close to a year if a recession occurs during a bear market. And it was all about 11 months. And if it's not a recession, it's only about six months. So as we've looked at markets, and you see down there a, a little from peak to trough, we saw the S&P 500 drop over 35%. We see everyone talking about potential recession. But this time, I think as you look at it, I think this time it's different. I know you've heard that before, but I think a little, some of this has been artificially created by what has happened because of the disease outbreak caused by the COVID-19. So if we kind of go into the U.S. market performances, if you, if you look at it a little bit deeper, so the three major industry indices in the United States, the S&P 500, the NASDAQ, and the Dow Jones have all dropped over 30%, and they did it so fast. Yeah, they did it in, in basically like a six-week period. Uh, if you look at all 11 sectors in the S&P 500, there in the below left corner, you saw no one was unscathed. Now, certain areas had a little bit more relative strength than others, uh, and certain areas were hit way, way harder than you know, some of the other areas that have seemed to be more of a necessity uh, to the global markets. You know, we'll touch on that a little bit more in terms of what we see our customers actually trading, and maybe where some areas of opportunity might in lie here over the next few weeks and months. Now, two big things that we, our investors at TD Ameritrade here in Singapore and also global traders look at all the time is in terms of commodities, and that's gold and oil in terms of areas of stress and how sometimes these things are related. So much like the markets have sold off, we saw oil kind of lead the way on this as Saudi Arabia and Russia kind of started a price war, and then we've seen global demand dry up. Now we see that WTI oil contract hovering around that $20 level. Now gold, a little bit more interesting, as a lot of our investors here in, in across Asia uh, do invest in different types of gold stocks and gold futures, as we have not seen quite as a, a appreciation as one would normally expect when we see the VIX, the volatility index in the US spike to levels we haven't seen in decades, and when you see the markets sell off at unprecedented levels, generally gold is more of a flight to safety than it has been uh, here. So our investors and traders around the globe are you know, paying close attention to where those gold levels here head over the next few weeks and months as well. Now in the bottom right-hand corner, it, it, this is something that, you know, most of these stocks people are very familiar with. You know, so most of, they're all in the fangs of so Apple, Amazon, Facebook, and Microsoft. These were some of our biggest net margin reductions, not only for us at TD Ameritrade, but around the globe. 
Now, some of this might have been paying for some of the other losses that they suffered across some of the larger sector declines, but we do see this information technology sector as an area of potential relative strength as we head you know, further out into the disease outbreak. Now, one last thing I kind of want to touch on before we kind of get into some uh, you know, areas of, of interest that we see our investors at TD Ameritrade participating in is what's happened with U.S. interest rates and in terms of where is the probability of recession and do we really think that matters. So if you look at it, the Fed slashed interest rates and the entire yield curve fell below 1% for the first time ever. So beginning of March, Fed cut 50 basis points. Middle of March, they cut another 100 basis points that bring the Fed funds down to effectively 0%. So as we look at this recession probability, now generally you have this Federal Reserve model and if it hits over 40%, there's generally been a good predictor uh, historically that we're going to be falling into a recession here in the next you know, kind of quarter or the, next, or the following quarter after. Now, some financial pundits and, and procrastinators uh, or prognosticators, I guess I would say, you know, are saying that maybe we're not particularly headed into that recession, but I think from a technical standpoint, I think it's almost inevitable. But this is where I say, does it really matter? And it's really because of something that is, is, has happened around the globe, you know, over the last kind of, uh, you know, few weeks that have helped kind of steady the ship. So as professional investors and brokers and longtime traders, you know, we've always tried to tell people, look, it's a good time for investors to remind themselves of the possible ways to approach this uncertain period. Look, if you're super worried, the first thing you want to not do is go all out of the market. You don't want to make a panic you know, decision and to, to simply dump all your positions because you think that the world is crumbling. You know, this is a mistake that many people have made in the past. And at times like these, look, I get it. Like, like, it's difficult to sit there and watch this. You know, it's hard for everyone. But what professionals tend to do, and what I've done for the last 25 years, is it, if you want to reassess your position and look for areas of relative strength, you should look to take off a small portion and reassess where your risk is. So you don't want to be overly emotional, but I get it. It's your money, and it's hard not to be emotional. That's why you know, I want you to think in smaller type terms, because if, as a professional trader and as market makers around the world, you don't want to get all into a position all at once, and you generally don't exit your position all at once either. So you know, decisions made out of fear or greed typically don't turn out so well for many in the long run. And if we look at historically, it has proven that not staying invested means missing out in most of the long-term market upside. Because even as a professional trader, it's almost impossible to pick the bottom and it's almost impossible to sell at the top. So my favorite slide, stimulus to the rescue. Uh, if you watched any of the financial news networks uh, or read any financial news uh, in mid to late February, you basically saw most financial pundits you know, said the Fed central banks, Congress, no one would act quick enough. Uh, no one, the package wouldn't be nearly, you know, nearly large enough. It wouldn't support small businesses, et cetera, et cetera. Well, look, the you know, central banks and the U.S. Fed and the U.S. Congress have had this coordinated effort to help prop up economies. We see an unprecedented amount of money, stimulus, backdrops to global economies. We've seen the Fed open up multiple swap lines with multiple countries to help kind of keep us through this period of uncertainty where we have this coronavirus gripping the world and people are still worried about where we are headed here in the near and medium and even long term. So these stimulus packages have really helped kind of stabilize global markets and helped kind of put some money into the consumer's pockets which has helped kind of put a little bit of sense of calm because we've seen large stimulus packages, not only from the US, but Europe, Asia, here in Singapore, you know, the governments are doing 
all they can to help kind of get us through this difficult period. Now, this is where I wanted to highlight on some parts of sector returns. You know, this is basically since February 19th. Now, these numbers basically change daily because how much of uh, market swings we see over the past few days and weeks. But some areas I wanted to highlight, you know, so if you look towards the top, some areas that we see our customers actively participating in uh, is consumer staples, healthcare, and information technology. So information technology are all the companies that basically allow you to do business in a non-face-to-face -face manner. Much like this uh, webinar that we're doing today through Zoom, you know, this is, you know, becoming more of a norm. And I'm sure many have participated in, in these with either work or your friends from home. Uh, another area of relative strength is we've seen across the consumer staples. You know, we've seen uh, lots of spending for the consumer staples, whether people are forced to stay at home or they're on a more just, you know, restaurants and, and, and basically going out of your home to eat and drink are not available. So a lot of these consumer staples are being spent, you know, and being set shipped by the likes of Amazon and others uh, around the globe. And then healthcare is an interesting one. You know, so healthcare, look, there are areas in, inside of healthcare, inside of pharmaceuticals and biotech, that are absolutely some areas that we've seen some relative strength uh, as people look for different things around COVID-19 and coronavirus potential uh, solutions. Now, one thing that I would want to kind of tell people to be careful about is much like in the early 2000s around the dot-com bubble, is every time a healthcare, pharmaceutical, biotech company garners headline interest because of anything they're doing around COVID-19, sometimes this causes the stock to move very, rather quickly. And But now I would tell you, when you see stocks like this and they're not well-known healthcare, pharmaceutical type companies, I would take a little bit closer look at them before I'm, I'm putting in a, a large portion of my investment into any of these companies that you don't know much about. Now on the flip side of that coin, uh, some things that have been a little bit more interesting here recently, and we've seen our, our customers at TD Ameritrade actively participating in, uh, and it's industrials, financials, and energy. So industrials have kind of come off the bottom, so to speak, in terms of some of the larger industrial companies, whether it's US Airlines, whether it's some of the you know, travel, uh, cruise lines, hotels, you know, it, if it's Caterpillar, you know, things that you know, kind of move the earth from the industrial side of the world uh, with Boeing. You know, a lot of these things were so significantly uh, sold off during this period of uncertainty that we've seen analysts around the globe starting to kind of dip their toe back in the water and look for at levels, at these particular levels. And as if we see the continued flattening of the coronavirus curve, we would like to see the economies around the globe starting to come back online. And all these, a lot of these companies inside of the industrial sector will be greatly impacted by that. Uh, financials, you know, when we saw central banks around the globe, when we saw the Fed cut their rates to basically zero, uh, financials, you know, had a significant sell-off. We saw earlier that like the the banks were you know, almost 45% sold off on the large US banks in the US. Now, since then, we've seen some type of reappreciation on that. And the last one on there is energy. Like this one has been a, you know, the, the dog of the S&P 500, and rightfully so. You know, we've had this price war between Saudi Arabia and Russia. We've had no demand, it's just a drying up demand. We have oversupply, we don't know what to do with it. Now, if you look at that, is back to 2016 when you saw this coordination or correlation of the market sells off, oil sells off, market comes back. <clears throat> is there a little bit of appreciation there that you know, will be built into the energy market? I think a lot of investors are looking for that because now we see OPEC, the non-OPEC countries trying to put together more of a substantial deal on terms of what they are cutting in terms of production. And with these production cuts, and if we start to see some type of you know, business is coming back online, airlines starting to fly, people starting to use fuel, <clears throat> that it's going to potentially prop up uh, some of these stocks that are in the energy sector that have been so significantly beat up. 
I mean, you could pick any one of them, you know, the big oil majors like Chevron and Exxon Mobil, some of the oil service providers, Halliburton, Schlumberger, a lot of these stocks have been significantly beat up and, and investors and analysts alike are starting to take a little bit closer look and starting to kind of, uh, I, I like to say this a lot, like dip their toe back in the water to look at valuation in terms of companies that they think are, are relatively priced in terms of uh, if we do see some type of oil rebound, that these stocks would be greatly impacted that on the upside. So the last kind of couple things I want to leave you with is uh, just U.S. kind of macroeconomic overview, global overview, and, and a little bit of hope. So on the U.S. macroeconomic overview, before going into the COVID-19 coronavirus outbreak period, like the U.S. economy was, was doing, you know, was doing pretty well. Uh, we had, you know, record low, you know, in terms of unemployment. We had a, a, the wages were starting to uptick. Uh, we had a stable economy and, and corporate earnings were slightly better than expected from the previous quarter. You know, that world has changed since then. And, and the big thing about what drives U.S. GDP is, is the consumer. So almost 70% of the U.S. GDP is driven by the U.S. consumer. And this consumer has essentially been taken offline because of all these stay-at-home mandates across the United States. Now, the, the stimulus checks have started to hit people's accounts in the U.S. And as the curve, as they hope that, they, that is, they're starting to see some type of peak here in the near future, is that the hope is that you know, this economy uh, of the U.S. starts to get back online and helps drive you know, global growth you know, around the U.S. Now, with global macroeconomic overview, you know, so if you look at this, you know, this is where I, I think, you know, before the coronavirus, you know, much like the U.S., I think, you know, it was, it was getting in a better place. You know, there was leading economic ind indicators for a global economy, but basically kind of put in a bottom, a bottom and was beginning to look to, into a, sta a rebound stage. Uh, central banks, you know, from around the globe, especially across Asia, you know, help pump liquidity you know, into these markets. Uh, now, as we look at areas of hope, you know, like most factories in China are open again. You know, output's still very diminished because, you know, people aren't commuting uh, from cities to work in the, you know, the typical numbers that we would normally see it. Uh, we continue to see it. You know, it's the only thing anyone talks about. Turn on the news in terms of what's happening with the spread of the coronavirus. Are we flattening that curve? You know, are, are, what is the world doing to, do, uh, to help with that? So from an economic standpoint, uh, central banks, governments around the world, stimulus around the world is unprecedented like no other time in history. And on the flip side of that, like the way that people are acting around the world is, is unprecedented as well whether it is work from home mandates that we have here uh, in Singapore or different parts of Europe, state shelter in place across the United States. A lot of these things are starting to take some type of impact. And if we see China start to come back online, uh, we start to see the better numbers out of Europe. And, if we're, and there's some hope coming from the numbers coming from the United States. Like all these things are, what I like to be optimistic about is the getting us back to a more normal economic times and environment and, and allowing us all to kind of get back to a regular day to day. Um, so I hope you were able to take something away from that in terms of what it is. You know, I want to thank you for listening. And I know it's difficult for many of us right now, uh, like work from home, you know, potentially out of work, uh, home e-learning, you know, it's very difficult you know, and just dealing with the disease in general. So stay strong, everyone. Uh, we'll get through this together. Thank you and God bless. Thank you, Chris, for those valuable insights. If you have any questions for Chris, post them on our pigeonhole that is being flashed on the screen now. Next up, we are joined by Economics and Strategy Head at Mizuho Bank, Vishnu Viratan. He will be sharing his thoughts on the U.S. administration weaponizing the U.S. dollar through sanctions and tariffs. All yours, Vishnu. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to join us today at this webinar. You've heard from Chris earlier on the global state of affairs, including 
recession risks, so on and so forth. So right now, I will move on and try to think out aloud about weaponizing the dollar and whether that is sound policy or not. Before we go to the topic proper, let's go to the definitive source of information. That's the Lord of the Rings, of course. Uh, and just as Frodo offered the ring to Gandalf, he says, don't tempt me, Frodo. It would build a power too great and terrible to imagine. And that, in a nutshell, sums up everything about the very risky seduction about weaponizing the dollar. Now, let's start at the beginning, weaponizing dollar 101, what the basics are, and we need to have some clarifications about this. The topic proper is the US administration has weaponized the dollar through sanctions and tariffs. Is this sound policy? The trouble with starting off is this is a loaded question, but let's try to unpack this. Let's start with what entails weaponizing the dollar. Is it a weaker dollar, which is often seen to be advantageous in global trade, or is it a stronger dollar for dominance? Uh, and this also includes in acquisitions, so on and so forth. Or is it simply a better control of the dollar, making it scarcer or more or less accessible by which we, uh, using that as a means to exert greater influence? It could be all of this. And how, second thing is, how does the US weaponize the dollar? Well, it can be through many means. Foreign policy is a big way. You've got treaties, sanctions, tariffs, so on and so forth. The Treasury also plays a huge part uh, in their fiscal policy where they issue bonds, as well as the US Treasury report where they pick out other currency manipulators, so implicitly pushing through a dollar policy. And finally, whether intended or otherwise, the US Federal Reserve, by virtue of conducting monetary policy, also exerts an influence on the dollar and does have a dollar policy, uh, not expressly, but implicitly, and it could inadvertently weaponize the dollar as well. Finally, why is the US in a unique position to weaponize its currency? It's simply because of the so-called exorbitant privilege of being the world reserve currency, which puts it in a pole position to weaponize its currency. So what entails weaponizing? Optically, the most prominent uh, event was the 1985 Plaza Accord. If we started at the end of 1980, this was a period of huge global divergence, so on and so forth. And you had the US dollar over the course of four to five years appreciating tremendously over 50 to 60%, while the yen and the Deutsche Mark depreciated in tandem. And in 1985, US got the G5, the then G5 to agree to devalue the dollar primarily getting the yen and the Deutsche Mark to appreciate against it. Was this then a weaponization of the dollar? Some may argue that it's a slightly mercantilist policy, but calling it weaponization may be overkill. Yet, what we need to understand is the backdrop, the context against which this took place. This was during the early 1980s, the Reagan era protectionism, where there were tariffs, tariffs which were pretty steep. So it is dangling these tariffs as threat that the US was able to maneuver Japan and Germany into appreciating the current, their currencies. And so that in a way was a weaponization of the dollar. Just two years after that was the Louvre Accord where the exact opposite was done. The dollar was being stabilized for it. It had depreciated too much too soon. And again, by wielding its policy, its unilateral dollar policy, the US was able to achieve some success with this. So the main point about weaponization, it's not on the specifics of the direction of the dollar or the course of action, but rather the fit for purpose intent and objectives that the US has. So in a nutshell, we want to think about it. Any dollar policy, and, and here to be clear, whether it's direct or indirect, to gain an economic advantage or political leverage can be deemed to be weaponizing of the dollar. And to think about weaponizing of dollar, it would be helpful if we did not think of it as a binary event where you either weaponize or you don't. Rather, we should think of it as a spectrum where you have different degrees of weaponization. 
in today's global state of affairs where uh, Twitter is perhaps the medium of choice for communication of global policy, I've just presented to you four examples where uh, the dollar has been weaponized, whether expressly or otherwise. Top left, you can see the ECB has been called out by Donald Trump. So he's proposing that they're conducting their monetary policy to depreciate the euro against a very strong dollar. And implicitly, there is a weaponization of the dollar to say that the Fed needs to do more. And so simultaneously, he has weaponized the dollar and made the Fed a tool of that weaponization, uh, whether or not the Fed wanted that. You also get similar tones coming out about China, Brazil, Argentina, all devaluing their currencies to the disadvantage of US trade position. Again, just by mention of this, the, the US is able to weaponize the dollar because the dollar does react to this, or there are consequences, which are the tariffs, so on and so forth. The slightly different example is your top right, where you can see Iran sanctions are being, uh, are being put across. And in this case, it's not, there's no express mention of the dollar, but what we need to note is by stifling the ability of Iran to trade and to acquire dollars is in itself a huge political tool. And again, the dollar is weaponized and the dollar is the conduit of foreign policy for the US here. And so we go to the question of how is the dollar weaponized? So bear with me on this nerdy account of things. But one way to think about it is weaponizing the dollar can take place through two mechanisms. One is the so-called flow impact. That's to say anything that has got to do with the flow of currencies is used as a conduit for weaponizing the dollar. So the flow impact can be through trade channels because the majority of trade is denominated in US dollars. Then the dollar policy can be weaponized to change global trade patterns and have global trade consequences. And by devaluing the currency, the dollar also has got huge impact. For example, exporters would receive less in their local currencies if the dollar is weaker and they've done their sales in the dollar. Uh, and this is just one example, but essentially there is a huge impact. Financial channels likewise. So any financial transaction because of the hegemony of the US dollar and the SWIFT network and the global banking channel network means that any regulatory uh, sanctions that the US passes has got a huge impact on financial flows for anyone impacted. Then there's also the stock impact. The stock impact is the so-called balance sheet impact, where it impacts not the flow of currencies or uh, uh, flow of commerce, but rather the wealth effect. And this is done where there are countries with huge holdings of US treasuries, which are denominated in dollars, as well as uh, individuals as well, holding uh, assets, which are usually denominated or valued in US dollars just by A, either affecting the value of the dollar or B, by restricting the flow and the movement of the dollar, the US can have a huge impact on the wealth and the valuations of countries as well as individuals. So that is how the weaponizing mechanism works. How then are the channels uh, and the tools for weaponizing the dollar uh, stacking up. So essentially, there are two main channels. One is the exchange rate channel, the so-called price channel. By, by changing the price of the dollar, by affecting the price of the dollar, uh, you can weaponize the dollar. The other is the sanctions channel, or rather the quantity, by adjusting, calibrating, and controlling the quantity of dollars available or uh, able to move. Also, the dollar can be weaponized. I'll just go back to the slide before and show to you the exchange rate mechanisms which are in green and the quantity or the sanction mechanisms which are in gray. And you can see some affect both by exchange rate as well as sanctions. So coming back, the exchange rate can be affected by tariffs which have a circular effect with the exchange rate. So tariffs could be a consequence of exchange rates not seen as desirable by the US or it could lead to exchange rates changing. There could also be political pressures. For example, the US Treasury report, which is issued twice a year, it calls out countries whom it, de it deems have been manipulating their currencies. And again, this indirectly exerts pressures either via the exchange rate channel or in terms of trade policies. 
monetary policy as well. And earlier, our example of the Plaza Accord was a multilateral channel by which uh, the, a, the US able to push through uh, a dollar policy, which is effectively weaponizing the dollar. Sanctions as well. Sanctions can come through foreign policy or regulations. And both of these are under the fine control of the Treasury as well as the US administration. And again, the dollar is either directly or indirectly used as a tool for achieving its political ends. So why is the dollar in this unique position? And the other way to frame this question is why can't other countries do this as effectively as the US? The simple answer which we touched upon earlier was because of its position as the reserve currency, which means that it has a disproportionately large impact on all other currencies, all transactions, so on and so forth. And where does it derive this heft? This sway on many of the global transaction space derives from the network effects. What the network effects means is that if enough people use the dollar, rely on it, whether it be for transactions or as a store of value or as a measure of value, if you've got a critical mass, then what happens is it becomes more difficult to move away from the dollar because it starts affecting one's personal valuations as well as the ease of transactions. So given that the US has got huge network effects in, in the dollar, it means that there are very high barriers for anyone trying to move away from the dollar, which explains why the Euro has had very little success uh, to challenge the dollar. And, and this holds true for many of the other major global currencies. The dollar is in pole position. And the one very easy way to look at this is, if you look at the chart at the bottom, in the black and the gray bars, you see the economic weight of the US as a share of global exports, US hardly accounts for 10% and it hardly accounts for a fifth, in fact, less than global GDP. Yet its share of global FX reserves, that is how countries store their wealth and in which denomination, that's well above 60%. And the dollar share of daily foreign exchange turnover is very close to 90%. That is to say, the majority of transactions and the majority of wealth is thought in US dollar terms or somehow linked to US dollar terms. And this is why the US is able to punch well above its economic weight in terms of having a dollar policy. And that brings us to the point that when people say cash is king, what they really mean is that the US dollar is king. And let us show you this to, with an extreme example. So earlier this year, as the COVID risks mounted and we saw huge volatility and sell-off uh, in the equity markets and the global financial markets. This you can see on your top chart here. What we've done is on the green, the green line shows us the Dow, how much it has, uh, how much it has moved, either fallen or risen, and we put it on an inverted scale. That's to say, as the green line is moving up, the Dow Jones is falling precipitously. And you can see the VIX index in red, which shows volatility in the equity markets, which is a fear gauge. And we can see as fear mounted to extreme levels and the Dow sold off tremendously, we had a huge panic in global markets. The corresponding time frame in the chart below shows us three different assets. One is the yen, the other is gold, and then we've got the US treasuries. We've picked these three because these three are usually taken to be safe haven assets. That's to say, in times of sell-offs and panic, these assets tend to do well. Money tends to, or funds tend to flood into these assets. Generally, this is held true. You can see that all these three assets rose into the panic sell-off in the equity markets. But at the most extreme point of risk, all three sold off in a big way. Gold sold off, yen sold off and 10-year US Treasury sold off. And that's because quite clearly at the extreme risk end, what happens is there is an indiscriminate liquidation of all assets because there's a huge demand to hold dollar cash. Everybody wants to hold US dollar, be it for precautionary reasons or to fill gaps in their portfolios. And here, we also know something that's a bit more peculiar. Because of its sheer importance, the US dollar cuts both ways. Because of its sheer importance, the US cannot fully control the dollar either. During extreme events, the dollar takes a life of its own. 
So what happens now? We've got the Fed ramping up on QE infinity, that's to say printing a lot more dollars. And this is where it gets interesting. Any other country doing this would have seen its currency slip out of its control and spiral downwards. But in the case of the US, what's perverse is that because there's a lot more US dollars printed, there would be a lot more US dollar assets also created and the world buys into this. And as you buy into this, the network effects increase, which means that actually the network effects of the dollar increases and the dollar's grip increases. And it lowers the cost for the US to weaponize the dollar. So that is the peculiar event. So is the weaponization of the dollar sound policy or not? Let's remember that the weaponization is based on the same, on the very principle that there's network effects. Enough people use it. So of course, in terms of dangers, the danger is that the weaponization of the dollar causes the world to move away from the dollar. But the mitigation is that there is no alternative to this, or TINA as markets like to say. Of course, the weaponization of the dollar also accentuates geopolitical tensions as uh, nations get very, very frustrated with one another. But equally, the weaponization of the dollar means there's no need for military conflict either. And finally, weaponization of dollar is subpart in, in economic terms because it creates a lot of uh, friction in global markets, which can be circumvented. However, moving away from the dollar could be a lot more disruptive for global markets as there's huge risk repricing, revaluation, and dislocations generally. So the point is, the weaponization of the dollar is certainly not sound, but moving away from the dollar's pole position is even more risky. And historically, the dollar has got weaponization in its DNA. From the Bretton Woods, when the pegging was done to the dollar and dollar became a conduit for the gold pack, to the Nixon shock, when it was unpacked from gold and it attained full authority as a fiat currency that controls everything else. It then mounted its, its influence on the world when Nixon was able to convince OPEC nations to settle all oil trades in dollars. So this created a huge pool of petrodollars that got recycled and reinforced the influence of the dollar. And finally, the pinnacle was when we got to the Plaza Accord where the dollar was able to dictate terms. So dollar weaponization, whether intended or otherwise, is entrenched in the system, is part of the infrastructure. And the fact is that the dollar cannot be depoliticized. So one way to look at this, and in fact necessarily turn it on its head, is to realize that the dollar cannot be de-weaponized in this geopolitical construct of things, which is how the world exists. So here's the conclusion. How do we conclude this? We cannot de-weaponize a weapon, so to speak. And that means that the dollar, because it's so formidable in, a, in an economic, and it has got huge economic sway, means that it also has got huge political heft. And that means that, that which comes with all of its exorbitant privileges. And at the end of the day, politicians cannot resist and they don't have Gandalf restraint. So it would build a power too great and terrible to resist. And that is the truth of the politics of the dollar. So while the dollar not being weaponized may be the ideal world, the reality is that we need to be price takers and brace for the realities of the dollar being weaponized to varying degrees. So what do we need to contend with? There are four big takeaways for us. One is that at this period, because of the increased tensions in the global order of things and due to huge quantitative easing, we need, we will need to be prepared for elevated dollar volatility. In particular, we could get huge bouts of safe haven demand for the dollar pushing it up. And at times when it's not, we could get the debasement risks pulling the dollar down. So they would get very whippy uh, dollar trades. As a corollary, it, may, it also means that the hedges for fiat, that's to say paper currencies losing its, uh, the confidence of the world means that there would be a demand for hedges to that. And that would be things like gold, other hard currencies and assets, and in fact, alternatives like bitcoins as well. We also know that as the dollar is increasingly weaponized, there'll be greater geopolitical uncertainty. And finally, in this environment, we could see a lot more capital market volatility in the emerging market or high yield space. So with that, uh, we can conclude this saying that it may not be the most sound policy, but it is something that we need to accept as the realities of geopolitics. Thank you. Thank you, Vishnu. If you have any burning questions for Vishnu, you can post them at www.pigeonhole.at slash tes webinar. Also, 
Feel free to vote for your favourite questions in the pigeonhole. We are going for a 5 minutes break. In the meantime, you can click on the links below to find out more about TD Ameritrade and the H Singapore. TD Ameritrade enables retail investors to trade the US markets by providing access to cutting-edge trading technology, discount commission rates, free education, and outstanding customer service. Clients can trade stocks, ETFs, options, futures, and options on futures using the award-winning Think or Swim trading platform. TD Ameritrade is fully licensed with the Monetary Authority of Singapore. Up next, we have Naguna Tiruchavam, the Head of Consumer Equity Research at Telemer. He has been an equity analyst covering emerging market equities since 2004. Today, he will be sharing with us who are the winners and losers from the COVID-19 situation. Over to you, Naguna. It's a great pleasure to speak to you at this very pressing moment where people are talking about the world's worst recession since 1930 and one in four human beings is facing a lockdown. I want to talk about the implications of COVID-19 on the stock market. In short, we want to figure out who the winners are and who the losers are. The first question that we need to address is, why do we need to worry? Now we've got a cartoon figure here, a very popular cartoon of an iconic figure in American humor. Uh, this is Alfred E. Newman who was a cartoon character in Mad Magazine, and his motto was, what, me worry? Because if you go delve into history, if you go back a hundred years, we faced a very devastating pandemic, which is far worse than the issue that we are facing today. We faced the great Spanish flu of 1918, which killed more people than the First World War. 50 million people died, which is about 3% of the world's population. It spread like wildfire. One in four human beings was infected. This part of the world, the part of the world that we are in, British Malaya, which is where Singapore was in those days, was very badly affected. Basically, about 1% of the population perished. The population here in British Malaya was about 3.6 million. And uh, Singapore was affected because it was a port. It was a vital source of rubber for the First World War. It was the main engine, uh, the main lubricant of the Southeast Asian economy. And uh, people were dying at a rate of 50 per day at one stage in 1918. In Singapore. The important thing we need to figure out is that at that time the health services here in Singapore were much worse than they are today. The hospitals were unable to cope. There were no ICUs. There were hardly any ventilators. It was very rudimentary then. Patients had to sleep on the corridors. Today we have a far better situation, a far better health infrastructure, we have ICUs, we have world-class hospitals, we have a government which is very proactive. Hence, the level of worry that one could encounter is of a far less magnitude than what people were worried about in 1918. But why should we worry today is another question. The question that we are grappling with is that the IMF has just come out with a report with the economic outlook, a special economic outlook, where they are expecting a contraction of 4.2% in 2020, which would be far worse than the contraction that took place in the global financial crisis in 2008. Uh, but just to go back to uh, the Spanish flu, uh, the, uh, the point I want to make is, apart from the health infrastructure, the stock market, the Dow Jones, actually rose in 1918 in the face of death. So the, 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 the obvious correlation between the state of the health in the world and the performance of the financial markets 
is not as clear cut as one would think. So we had a 12 percent rise in 2000 in 1918 and 24 percent drop so far in 2020. But the real economy that we are experiencing is clearly under a lot of stress with so many with the great lockdown. The IMF has also said that there would be a 12 percent drop between 4Q19 and 2Q20. The emerging markets in particular would be badly affected with a drop of about 5%. So these are very stark, very worrying, very difficult numbers for an economy to contend with. Hence, we need to figure out what are the sectors in the economy, what are the sectors in the stock market that would weather the storm that would be able to, uh, to perform under such stress. And I have come up with uh, a sector that I feel would be likely to thrive. And that is the so-called stay-at-home sectors. And this sector, it's a, it's a cluster of sectors, so to speak, includes home entertainment, social media, e-commerce, as well as uh, businesses which deliver things to people. So let's take home entertainment. The iconic home entertainment stock right now is Netflix. Netflix is a subscription model. It has virtually unlimited entertainment. It's now tailored its content to Asian and emerging market users. It's proved to be very, very popular. The level of downloads and usage levels have increased three or four fold in the last six weeks. And unsurprisingly, in the face of this massive sell off, where the NASDAQ at a certain point was down 12%, now it's actually down even more. Netflix, Facebook, Amazon, and other stay at home businesses have outperformed the sell off. So that shows that the, these businesses, have some merit in a market of this nature. Emerging market e-commerce, or rather the companies that either sell things through e-commerce or perform e-commerce like functions in emerging markets have also outperformed. So you have people like Alibaba, there are uh, regional variations, uh, you have uh, a company called uh, CUS, which is uh, Southeast Asia, uh, a Southeast Asian e-commerce player. It's listed in the US. Uh, it operates uh, a, ne a network, uh, an e-commerce platform called Shopee. So that is a, is a great proxy for this. But these are the sorts of businesses which could thrive. I mean, coming back to the stay-at-home phase, the stay-at-home sector, another thing that you could look at is Facebook. Facebook usage, ad, uh, reaching consumers through online media, that's a space that would be resilient in this sell-off. But when assessing the, the value of these businesses, a very important indicator should be the cash sustainability index. We have devised this proprietary metric to assess the degree to which an e-commerce player in an emerging market or in a developed market can sustain its cash flow. The great thing about these businesses, the tricky thing about these businesses, is that in many cases, they are growing their revenues, but they're burning their cash flow. They're recording losses, and more importantly, the cash flow from operations are in many cases uh, burning more cash than they're generating by their revenues. <clears throat> Which means that they have to constantly go to the market, either to bondholders or to equity investors, either to bond investors or to equity investors, to replenish their capital in their businesses. Replenishing your capital in a market of this nature would be very difficult because the stock markets have basically 
closed down on IPOs. We haven't heard, we've hardly heard of any IPOs in 2020. And the ones which are planned have been shelved. Bond issues have also been very difficult. <coughs> Interest rates have fallen, but it's very, it would be hard for a company, an e-commerce company, which has very little collateral to raise money in this market. So the cash sustainability index rewards companies that are cash flow generative as opposed to cash flow destructive. And on that basis, Alibaba comes up on top, eBay comes up on top. Over here in this region, C, uh, which is uh, the e-commerce platform for Southeast Asia listed in the US, that scores very poorly on this metric. So clearly investors need to exercise a great degree of caution and use this metric as a, uh, for illustrative purposes. So just moving on, I would like to now talk about what are the companies or the uh, entities that would be under pressure? What are the blow ups that we are going to see in this market? What, what's going to be the big short, so to speak, in this market. So if we were to rewind to 2008, there was a, a great hedge fund investor called Michael Burry. Michael Burry later became a prominent figure in a book written by Michael Lewis called The Big Short. And there was a movie made after it, made on it. So you might remember him. Uh, the, the important thing to remember about this investor was that he was born, or rather at the age of two, he had a, uh, a rare uh, condition, a rare illness that uh, led to him being blind in one eye. So Michael grew up with just one eye. Ironically, a young boy who grows up with one eye sees the world differently, both literally and metaphorically. He became very, very antisocial. He was just focusing on the numbers. He rarely made eye contact with his peers, but he delved into the numerical analysis to a far degree, a far greater degree, both as a student and later as an investor. So having qualified as a doctor, he became a hedge fund investor. He proved to be very, very prescient and very, very successful in identifying some of the weaknesses during the global financial crisis. And he shorted the, um, the United States uh, mortgage market. And he made 700 million for his hedge fund. Apparently he personally made about $100 million. So that is a phenomenal achievement uh, in the face of such economic and financial downturn. So in this scenario, investors need to display a Michael Burry type insight. They need to delve into the details of companies to identify the sorts of companies that are going to be vulnerable in a context of this nature. In my mind, there are three, and the three types are on this slide. One, very vulnerable category in this market would be the companies without inventory. Now, inventory is a essential concept in finance. So let's take a very simple example. A company that sells a, re, a, a, a shop that sells oranges, Let's say that shop has about 100,000 oranges to sell. If there is a shutdown and the shop is closed for a month, it can sell the 100,000 oranges at a later date. If there's a shutdown in April, maybe when the shop opens in May, it can sell it having stored the oranges. But in other businesses, in certain service businesses, for example, in the airline business, if an airline has 1 million seats to sell over 365 days. If there's a shutdown for one month, 
the 1 million seats that they were hoping to sell for that month are gone forever. They cannot store the seats and sell it later because that inventory has completely disappeared. So airlines are obviously very, very vulnerable. Hotels, which have a similar thing. So they have a finite number of rooms and room days, say they have 500 room days. And there's a closure that a hundred of those 500 days counts those hundred room days. That's the end of it. Even if they discount it, it doesn't make a difference because no one is ever going to buy it. It's all disappeared. Those are the businesses that are under tremendous pressure in this market. So the airlines are familiar. We know AirAsia, SIA, these are all under a lot of pressure. Uh, the countervailing factor for the airlines is that they could be a beneficiary of a bailout. So again, shorting them or taking a negative view of them has to be viewed with some caveat. The second uh, category are companies with high fixed costs. High fixed costs are companies such as uh, the cinemas or the uh, theme park operators. So over here in Singapore, uh, you can go to GV cinemas or Shaw cinemas. These cinema companies uh, have been virtually empty because we have uh, a shutdown. And even before that, people were dissuaded from going to the cinema. And now that there's a business model which provides home entertainment like Netflix, which is in some ways superior to the cinema. But leaving that aside, these are businesses which have fixed costs. They have paid for the content. They've paid for the electricity. They've paid for the infrastructure. They have workers. And they cannot reduce those fixed costs irrespective of the fact that the revenue has gone away. Those companies are also very, very vulnerable. Now, the third category are the companies that have raised a lot of debt just before this blow up. Again, we have lots of hotel companies in Asia that have taken advantage of the low cost of capital that you have in places like Thailand and acquired hotel chains in Europe. Both in Europe and Asia, the hotel business is at a complete standstill. There are companies such as uh, Minor International, where its iconic hotel uh, in, um, in Bangkok apparently has just 5% uh, occupancy, according to some anecdotal evidence. These are the companies that if you had a Michael Burry type insight, you would be looking to short or to sell. This does not amount to an explicit recommendation, but I'm just giving you an indication of some of the vulnerabilities in this market. Now, moving on, I want to talk about another historical figure, a figure from the 1920s called Ivor Kruger, who was known as the Match King. He, his success was, uh, was to develop what was known as safety matches. In those days, matches were viewed as a high-tech commodity. So he built a chain of a network of match factories in Europe and in the United States, which uh, was a very uh, successful multinational in the 1920s. So the match king, Ivor Kruger, was a highly revered businessman. However, his empire came crumbling down during the depression of the 1930s because it was exposed that he had manipulated the accounts during the 1920s and created fictitious sales. So in a market where there's such a downturn, you face Accounting fraud and accounting fraud can be exposed when the economy grinds to a halt in, uh, in this manner. So we've already had uh, a scandal erupt. Uh, there's a company called Luckin Coffee, China's alternative or answer to Starbucks. This company has been uh, uh, exposed and there are reports of fabricated sales of about $370 million in 2019, which has just come to market and the stock has been suspended or rather the stock has been, the stock has lost 90% of its value. So events like these are going to become more and more frequent. 
So to, to sum up, investors need to do three things. Number one, investors need to look at stay-at-home businesses, home entertainment, e-commerce. These are the businesses whose models are very, very attractive at this point. The second is that they need to look at selling or shorting the companies which are vulnerable, the companies with inventory, with leverage, with a high fixed costs, as I mentioned. And the, the, the third thing that investors need to be very, very alert to are the blow-ups. So keep your eyes on the sanctity of the accounting standards of a company before delving into it. We need to adopt Michael Burry's insight and the care with which he delved into the nitty-gritty of the numbers. With that thought, I leave you with some sobering lessons, but with, also with the hope that the situation today is vastly different to what it was in 1918. And one can only hope that human ingenuity will take us out of this morass and into a brighter future. Thank you. We have come to the last and most exciting part of our webinar. Gula, our moderator, will be taking questions from the Pigeon Hole for our speakers. Over to you, Gula. So uh, let's kick start with the with a panel discussion. Um, I'll start with the most popular question on our pigeonhole. Um, and uh, there are 42 votes for this one. And I'm gonna direct this question first to Chris, Chris Branken, our, our CEO of TDA Ameritrade Singapore, who's also the sponsor of this event. Um, Chris, so over to you. Which sectors of the economy are likely to recover the fastest and which the slowest? And we're talking about the US economy. Uh, look, I, I think uh, you know that is something that is talked about all the time. Uh, you know, as we can't avoid anything is around discussions in terms of what coronavirus has done to impact not only the U.S. stock market, U.S. economies, but around the globe. And our customers at TD Ameritrade are looking for areas of relative strength. Uh, so going, I like to look at it kind of pre-coronavirus and then post-coronavirus to see where things might have some relative value. Uh, you, you hear a number of different people kind of talk about things around the information technology, uh, whether you, you call it part of your stay at home index or uh, basically I like to call it like do business non face to face index. So anything in this information technology sector going into pre coronavirus, you know, kind of around Chinese New Year, like, you know, all these areas were looking pretty strong. Uh, you know, and whether that's, you know, delivery or, you know, I, you know, information technology at home, you know, whether it's the Amazons, Facebooks, you know, Googles of the world uh, have been relatively strong and would look for some type of quick type of recovery or continued recovery uh, if, as we see the flattening of the, of the disease curve around the globe, as economies hopefully start to come back online here over the next few weeks and months. Uh, another area that, like, that a lot of our customers like to look at is around healthcare and pharmaceuticals. But this is an interesting one to me. And I, and the I, reason why I say that is it, it reminds me a little bit of the dot-com uh, bubble type area, where if you have a pharmaceutical company or a biotech company and you just make mention of the word COVID-19, your stock might garner some headline interest that might not necessarily be dollar for dollar in terms of where the stock might move in the near term. So what we tell our customers, if you are looking to participate uh, in this biotech, pharmaceutical kind of healthcare uh, resurgence, so to speak, pay closer attention to these companies maybe you've never heard of that are on the smaller side that somehow are trying to come up with some type of therapeutic or some type of you know, response to what the coronavirus has, has done to the globe and take a little closer look in terms of their numbers and in terms of what their actual valuations are. Uh, now, Gula, did you want me to go into that, that? Those are some areas that we see relative strength, you know, or we kind of, you know, like we have some things on the flip side of that coin, I think, as well, uh, or are we kind of going into that later? Um, yes. What about the, the slow? Do, do, you want, do you think people should avoid the oil? Lots of people have been speak, talking about oil price collapsing. Yeah. Um, Look, is, oil, oil, is it, is it a, a deep hole all the way down back into the subterranean or is there any hope there? Look, I think there's hope, but, see, but that's the wild card here. So, you know, you, so you had 
you know, uh, it, it's almost like they're lagging, you know, the globe where the stimulus packages and, and, and the Fed and the central banks have pumped in so much liquidity and some type of backstop to businesses around the globe. Now, you know, OPEC, you know, non-OPEC members, we get Saudi Arabia, Russia, the U.S., like if they come to some type of coalition and, and help continue to cut some of this demand, and then we start to see global economies come back online, then you know, we could see some type of recovery in that oil price. But I mean, it has just been absolutely hammered. And on some of these stocks, you know, so especially some of the big oil majors, some of the oil service providers, you know, I mean, t just pick any one of them. Uh, you know, they have been down 60, 70, you know, 80 percent on some of the smaller oil service providers. So you really got to look at it and see who's capitalized you know, enough to be able to sustain that. You see some of the oil service providers. You just saw Schlumberger cut 75 percent of their dividend. You, you see, uh, you know, a lot of these companies trying to preserve some cash. And the ones that are more capitalized, you know, the, the larger kind of service providers, uh, you know, Chevron, Exxon Mobil have a lot more cash than some of the smaller oil players, the, those companies, if we start to see oil get a little bit of footing, we get the, the demand, you know, you know, to come back at all. I mean, it, it, you know, look, I mean, look over any major city these days. I mean, there's, there's no airplanes flying. I mean, they're not using oil. I mean, but they're running out of places to store it. So, you know, I, I think, you know, as OPEC and, and the non-OPEC countries and the in U.S. and things have tried to cut demand out of the market, uh, if we start to see the, the economies come back online, that's where you're going to see potential upside in, in the energy sector as a whole. Because uh, right now, you start to see analysts you know, around the globe, traders, TD Ameritrade, traders around the globe that look at it as, look, hey, is this already priced in? Because people are starting, I, I say this all the time lately, like starting to dip their toe back in the water looking for some of these oil service providers, these oil companies that have valuations that look pretty attractive at some of these prices. Okay, thanks, thanks. So um, the impact of all this on, on ASEAN and, and Asia and Singapore, I'm going to direct this to Vishnu. Um, what businesses are gonna recover and which businesses are, are going to you know, be stuck in the mud, so to speak? Sure. Um, I just wanna start off by saying that, um, you know, Chris gave a very, very comprehensive view uh, of the sectors that are going to do well uh, and, and how to think about these. So I, I really liked his framework around that. And I think Singapore uh, being a very small open economy would actually uh, reflect a lot of what Chris has said. And also we also have got huge oil exposures. So uh, there's a lot of resonance there. So the only value I can add, uh, or at least a, a different way to think about things is uh, to think about behavior uh, pre and post. So what we want to think about uh, Chris set the framework very well. And then beyond that, what we want to think about is whether behavioral patterns change permanently after COVID. That's to say, do you get a lot more work from home? Uh, do you get a lot more home-based learning solutions becoming far more popular? Uh, and, and so we can extend that. And to the extent that behavior becomes sticky around certain, uh, certain things we become uh, exposed to during this time by force, that can become... Uh, one area in which we could see an extended uh, differential in valuation. So valuations can move differently uh, based on that. Uh, the other way to think about it also is uh, around the behavior post-COVID, I think it's going to be a function of three things. It's going to be a function of uh, how well balance sheets hold up after we recover from this or as we grow from the, uh, recover from this. Secondly, it's also going to be about confidence. How confident are we even as we come through the recovery? So recovery can be one that is uh, a bit more tentative or one that's very confident. And finally, it's also about preferences, something we talked about, behaviors that stick. So putting these three things together would require us to get a good sense uh, of how much uh, of a balance sheet hurt or impact we took initially uh, as we come out of this. And that's going to determine things like, so to, to, to borrow an example from Chris, uh, things like, uh, for example, how much capital expenditure oil companies might uh, then indulge in. So there would be uh, a differentiation between uh, the oil servicing guys, those who do the essential services versus those who supply oil companies for CAPEX. If confidence is low, uh, balance sheet hits are high, then we can think that the, the capital expenditure aspect of it would recover with far more lag 
uh, and a lot less compellingly in the initial stages. So these things apply across. Um, and, and, and I'll also um, uh, have to go on and say that uh, the, the, the way to think about um, uh, things was also laid out by Nirgunan earlier when he talked about products uh, that companies have. Uh, and and I, I want to frame it as how perishable these products are. So like he rightly pointed out, uh, you know, a, a hotel room occupancy on, on a night, the perishable uh, index is very high. It's just one day and it perishes. Uh, the oranges example he, he gave, uh, then that the perishability of that uh, is slightly less vulnerable. So we also want to think about businesses along that way. But when we think about inventory and products, we also want to think about how exposed are they to supply chains. Uh, and, and where these supply chains are placed. So if they're all predominantly in one country, then the, uh, the kind of vulnerabilities are also higher because the hedge is lower. So there, there are a multitude thing of things to think about. Usually manufacturing tends to recover quite well uh, out of, uh, uh, out of a, a situation like that. This was our SARS experience. We want to be careful that it doesn't apply perfectly. And I think it'd be far more differentiated because uh, the, the tech solution, so on and so forth, could recover far better than the CAPEX end of things. So this is also something we want to consider uh, as we go through. And, and the behavior aspect will, will tell us whether people come back uh, with a vengeance on pent-up demand for travel and, and hospitality, or they're more cautious about how they recover from this. So that, that's about uh, what I can add on to what has already been comprehensively covered. Thanks, thanks, Vishnu. Okay, Nirgunan, I'm going to ask you something slightly different. You know, there's a question uh, of, uh, after this one, which is who is the dark horse in this COVID situation? And, I'm, I'm, and, and I, I know you know many, you've written about many dark horses, um, and I'm just wondering which dark horse you think would um, end up as the first to cross the line in the next, in the next bull market? When you say dark horse, are you talking about companies that uh, have uh, uh, vulnerabilities in their accounting or in their business model that are bound to fail? I think the question is, who is gaining? Oh, are you looking at, uh, when, you, yes. when you say dark horse, are you meaning companies that are, that are uh, underrated at the moment, but yes. might win? Underrated and, you know, horse, you know, horse racing, the one that wins yes. and the unexpected, the unexpected winner. We want the unexpected winner. Yes, so the unexpected winners are companies that you, we may not have even um, been on our radar. For example, there is a company called iFlix, which is the Asian equivalent of Netflix. They have a subscription model where they collect $3 a month. They have accumulated a lot of content in the Asian markets as well as some other emerging markets. And they're providing Asian language content as entertainment. So if people um, are dissuaded from going to the cinema, or looking for alternative forms of stay-at-home entertainment, we could see a company which is cash flow negative uh, is in the pre-listing stage. We could see a company like that come to market and be welcomed by the capital markets. The IPO market has basically shut down for the last two months or three months. 2020 has been a disaster for the IPO market, but eventually if it does come back, we could see these companies as stock market winners. Nigi, are you there? Yes. All right. Okay. I think Does that answer your question? Yes. Yes. That's that's good. Yeah. Um, could I move to to Chris in in the U.S. Is there anything we should be watching for that's under everybody's radar? There's been a lot of talk of this. I know you say be careful of the pharmaceuticals, but there's been a lot of talk uh, on, in, on, in the internet, on Bloomberg and everywhere else, on the company, and I'm sure you've heard of it, called Gilead. What, do, you, do you have a view on that? Uh, look, you know, Gilead Sciences, you know, just recently, uh, it just happens to be where I'm from, University of Chicago, uh, ran a, a test, but you know, it wasn't a double blind test. You know, they took 125 people that were, you know, on ventilators and provided a therapeutic, and 123 of them lived. So, so it, it, you know, so there are things that Gilead Sciences then 
overnight popped up, you know, 13, 14%, you know, gives a little bit of hope in terms of what's going on. Uh, look, Gilead is a massive pharmaceutical company that has been doing this for a number of years. I mean, I think they're, from a relative standpoint, like that would fit in the category where we see our customers participating in looking at, at as net new buyers, uh, as companies that might have a potential solution uh, that comes out, you know, over the next, you know, you know I mean, it, these things take a while and they get out of phase one to phase two to, to where it actually produced and used it, you know, around the globe. I mean, it, it's a, you know, they're speeding up everything as much as possible, but, you know, I mean, best case scenario, you're still looking at well, at least nine months, I mean, more, you know, probably closer to 15 months. But I think to know that something is being worked on and it's, and it is a universal coordinated effort that knows no bounds in terms of, you know, the, there's no, no one's trying to, hide things from other pharmaceutical companies as people try to share information to come out with some type of solution. For me, I, the, I, if you talk about a dark horse, I, I think there's an area that maybe doesn't get as much attention as I, I think it should lately. As you saw central banks around the globe and the Fed continue to cut interest rates, basically the Fed's down to zero, it is, is the financial you know, sector it is something that has been extremely kind of uh, under pressure you know, over the last few weeks. But with this backstop that the U.S. has given for the large U.S. banks, uh, they're, they're building in, you know, a, a, a potential kind of runway as they're as they're trying to get them to, you know, offer small business loans or uh, trying to get the money flowing back into the economy. And if you take any of these giant banks that, you know, some of them have lost, I mean, like 50, 60 percent, you know, whether you're looking at Bank of America, or Wells Fargo, J.P. Morgan. These banks are very well capitalized. They have a backstop from the U.S. government. Uh, you know the, the, the you know the Congress is trying to get you know people to you know the money to where the business is needed. So I think banks, you know, over the next kind of three to six months, could be an area that could see some decent appreciation as we see our customers looking at being net new buyers over the last few weeks uh, or last couple of weeks more so uh, on the big banks in the U.S. Thank, thank you. Um, can I move to Vishnu? Vishnu, do you have a sector that you think is under the radar? Well, unfortunately, because I, I, I'm not a sector expert, so I, I'm not going to stick my neck out and uh, talk about something I don't know, even though that's my default job description to talk about what I don't know. Um, but I'll, I'll say this much. I mean, I'll, I'll just pick up from where Chris left off. Uh, and, and I want to put forward something. I mean, Chris and, and Nirguran can give you very good uh, insights on which sectors are positioned uh, pre-COVID, post-COVID, recovery, so on and so forth. Let me give you something on the stimulus. I mean, there are two ways to think about this. One is uh, you've got uh, global central banks pumping in a lot of liquidity. So one sense we can get is this is going to, of course, have an impact on asset markets. Some are positioned better than others. Some banks have got more access to liquidity than others, uh, so on and so forth. So that's one angle to think of. And the other one was, was, just, was just what Chris mentioned. Uh, which is the huge fiscal stimulus with all the funds and facilities created for various industries and various companies, uh, it is not going to be even across. So the access to these mean that by default, any company that can tap onto this to extend their lifeline and to, 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 you know, to, to shore up their position are going to be better placed as the recovery takes shape because the recovery uh, will probably encompass more uh, of, the, uh, of, of the broader economy. So really it is the survivability during this period and the ability to build up on strengths during this period that's going to matter. Uh, and, and from that angle, I, I think uh, if you're, you're looking at, at some of, of the, uh, the, the, the tech sectors, um, and as well, uh, I think those come up uh, looking fairly better uh, than, than others. So I'll, I'll leave it there. I did say I won't dip my feet there and I just stripped the word. Okay, well, um, stay, 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 stay there, stay there, Vishnu, because the next question I'm, I'm, we're going to look at is what is the impact of endless QE on the US dollar and, um, and, and its subsequent impact, you know, the meaning for the, for the, of the our ASEAN currencies for emerging market currencies? Right. I mean, the easy thing for me to do is to say, okay, let's borrow from uh, our experience in the post-GFC period where we saw QE, QE1, 2, 3 with the twist, so on and so forth. Um, but I think where we need to start is by defining what's endless QE. 
because I know the Fed just removed uh, any ceiling and said, look, we'll do whatever is necessary. Uh, so I think to form any view on it, we need to get our heads, wrap our heads around two things. One is when we say endless, do we mean it to be, uh, you know, uh, really a, a continuous thing that's got no stop? Or do they intend to stop somewhere, but they just haven't predefined it yet? So that's the first thing, to see what size your balance sheet reaches to. And just to give you a ballpark, the Fed uh, has done a lot. And in, in terms of absolute bazookas, they've got the biggest. But relative to the size of the economy, uh, they're just at 20 odd percent. Uh, the balance sheet, the Fed balance sheet size is just 20 percent of uh, the GDP, whereas uh, BOJ is far ahead. They're over 100 percent. So this is where we know the Fed can do a lot more. And the second aspect that's going to be really important is the speed because we know from our taper experience that the speed of quantitative easing slowing mm -hmm. will reverse the effects. So the, the effects we're talking about, the offending effects we're talking about is typically we think this would lead to A, a weaker dollar, because by virtue of, at the risk of oversimplifying, by virtue of printing more dollars, uh, a weaker dollar uh, results. And also you get asset price inflation uh, that tends to favor uh, stocks uh, that do well in, in, in growth industries. It also favors hard assets as a hedge against debasement. So that aspect, these two about are- property, really, is it property? Yes, property is also a hard asset, uh, though I think there's some discounting of it because it's harder to liquidate on, on, on very short notice. So when you, when you price all that in, hard assets tend to do very well. But then you need to think about uh, the moment it starts slowing, some of these effects could start to stall or partly reverse. So this is where, we have no clarity on. Uh, if, if I told you I've got a view on this, I'd be lying. I, I don't know exactly where they're going to stop, but we do know that they will slow down a little bit at some point. So what we would expect in, in, in the interim is you get a, a fairly volatile dollar. And, and really what complicates the picture is the fact that the dollar is also a bit of a safe haven. So right now, markets are going to be between chasing the liquidity and then wanting to uh, hunker back down, uh, you know, uh, to, to say, look, this is a, uh, we, we really need to, to protect against certain extreme risks. So th this is going to challenge the view on asset markets. Okay, thanks. Vishnu, I'm, I'm going to stay with you. Stay there, stay there. Um, is the coming recession going to be short-lived with a quick recovery or deep and lasting? Um, so I think the question should be, question should be V-shape, U-shape or L-shape. Okay? And, and then, and then I'm going to ask all the other, the other two speakers. I think let's leave out the L shape, U shape or V shape, because there's three of you and you've got to vote on these two. Quick. <laughs> uh, all right. Look, I'm, I'm Vishnu I'm first. Be... Chris, next. Go on. Go on. Decide. Okay, I'm, all right. I'm, I'm going to be really cheeky about this. I'm going to say, I, I don't want you to. Can't stand, uh, you can't stand on both legs. Hop on one. Okay, I'm going to lie down here. And I'm going to tell you, uh, the only V in this discussion is going to be the one attached to my name. Uh, I, I, so, that, I mean, so what do we think about the recession? Uh, okay, surely there's a downturn. And, and we also see a recovery coming through, albeit with a bit of a lag. What challenges this view uh, is the fact that uh, unlike the GFC, where it was about freeing up liquidity and rebuilding confidence, uh, this one is slightly different because it's uh, got to do with... Uh, uh, things like social distancing, uh, the ability to start back. So there'll be a lot of interruptions. So, we, so it's going to be, and, and I, let me then try to make it up to you. So I'm, I'm going to come around and say it's going to be more you than B because the initial stages of recovery are going to be tentative and very cautious because people will still be in cash preservation mode. Uh, balance sheets would have already have taken a hit. So the ability to splash out is going to be constrained. Of course, uh, the caution here is that because of the QE type stimulus, uh, the argument is to say asset markets could go slightly towards V. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think my argument is going to be, if you're going to look at the real economy, uh, the recovery is going to be more U than V. Uh, and that would be the short answer. I'll, I'll pass the floor to Chris to give you a lot more color on this. Well, yes, thanks, Vishnu. Uh, yeah, look, I think you brought it up earlier, like, you know, it, it's around behavior, right? So, like, uh, I, I, like I would say I, I would be more in the camp of V, but with maybe a little bit of choppiness. And as I was thinking about that, I go, that looks like a W. Uh, you know, so, uh, so uh, like I, I, I'm, I, I'm probably more optimistic than a lot of people that I talk to in the financial world 
Uh, you know, I know a lot of people in New York, and it's really hard for them to be optimistic right now. I mean, they're the epicenter of everything, of the break of the outbreak right now. Uh, I, I just, as you look at, you know, China's factories starting to come back online, you start to see, you know, Europe get a better understanding and hold on terms that they think they're at their peak, and you know, maybe the U.S. is a couple of weeks away from that. So if we get that in terms of continuing down that path, I think we, we, we will see it come back online. You know, and we talk about changing behaviors and work from home. Look, I can tell you people that I talk to on a regular basis that are in Chicago and New York that have been at, you know, shelter at home or work from home for, you know, five weeks already. Look, they're ready to get back out in society. I mean, yeah, because like, you know, like some of the things that have been, you know, we talk about behavioral changes like e-learning at home. Like, look, if you got multiple children and you live in an apartment in Asia, like learning when you're working from home is difficult. You know, I'm sure there's lots of people on this, you know, this call here that, like, that would 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 uh, would agree with me on that. So I think you know, for the recovery itself, I, I it really like there's a few unknowns, right? I mean, but I think there's signs that we're headed in the right direction. And because of all the stimulus that we got from different, you know, uh, countries around the globe, we got the U.S. Fed, we got the U.S. Congress you know, backstopping not only the U.S., but open, opening up multiple swap lines with the different countries around the globe, it is if we get a control on this, I think there's a, uh, there's a lot of pent-up demand that, that will come back into the markets. But I still think there's a little bit of choppiness here over the next few weeks. Uh, so that's where we see our customers focusing more right now in those areas that we talked about relative strength. And, you know, you know, picking at some of the of the of the riskier type of assets uh, that, that have been beat up so badly. Okay, thanks. I'm going to ask Niggy the second part of that question. What is the role of pent up demand in in the international recovery? Uh, we've seen a little bit of that in China, but but it, it's not sufficient. What's your view? Because I saw you putting up a V shape for the V shape recovery. Yeah, yeah. Nirgunan, are you there? <laughs> yes, it's true. Nirgunan, are you there? I saw him putting yes. up his. Yes. 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 Uh, what is the role I can of pent up? With the, with yeah, the, you, you the and Tupi. Yeah, a V shape. I, I am. I saw that. I saw that. Yeah. Yes. So, if I may um, elucidate on what uh, uh, Chris said, we certainly are on the road to recovery. And if you look at the view of the financial markets, the, the market's only down 15% in the US year to date. At one point, it was down 33%. It's rallied 27% since the third week of March. So we are now well into the recovery route. Uh, it could be the case that the market has discounted the next two quarters. The catastrophic numbers that we're going to see from uh, the uh, national statistics as well as the company results has already been factored into by the market. We all know that the shutdown is very bad for the economy. But beyond that, the stimulus as well as some of the other measures are giving people comfort that the light is at the end of the tunnel. As Chris said, we could see some choppy behavior over the next couple of weeks, but uh, maybe the worst is behind us. And as economies open up, as the United States opens up various parts of their economy, we could see the recovery gathering momentum um, as we go on. Having said that, we are still some way ahead. We still, st we still, we still need to get a vaccine that would arrest the spread of this uh, horrible disease. There are a number of other imponderables, but uh, I'm veering towards the optimistic side. Okay, that, that's great. And stay there, stay there, Nigi, because the next question is about the stock market. What is the panel's view on the outlook for the stock markets in ASEAN, Hong Kong, and Singapore? And uh, how does the performance of the, how are they correlated to the S&P 500? You start, then, then Chris, because Vishnu will say that he doesn't look at the stock market. Okay. All right, Nigi, go ahead. Yes. Uh, the uh, Southeast Asian stock markets are extremely correlated to uh, the Western markets, especially to the U.S. Uh, these are trade-dependent economies. They're export-oriented. Uh, the, uh, they're viewed as emerging markets. However, um, 
some of the markets, Singapore in particular, has uh, all the hallmarks, all the characteristics of a developed market. Um, so the correlation factor is very high with the West. Okay, um, Chris, yeah, do you have a view on this? Oh, you, you tell us about the US stock market. You must have a view on the US stock market. Well, I, would, I mean, I think, you know, cautiously optimistic that it would be a good uh, term that uh, we, we're, our customers are looking at right now. Uh, we just saw our customers in March were, were net sellers, but not panic. You know, so I, I, we saw, you know, a lot of the selling, you know, might have been around some of the, some of the stocks that were at or near 52-week highs and, you know, early Feb, you know, kind of paying for some of maybe their other positions, uh, but not all cash. I mean, and we, you know, we kind of, you know, we count that as professional trader, as an ex-professional trader. You never want to be all out of the market. Uh, in times like this, because you know, even as a professional, it, no one can pick the bottom, and, and nobody sells the top. So you want to make sure that you are kind of invested over the course of it. Uh, for I mean, so like in terms of, I, I think that you know the S and P five hundred, you know, it does help kind of price or drive where things are going on the emerging market space. And, and I can tell you from the U.S. you know exchange traded products. You know, EEM, you know, it's one of, you know, one of the more well, largely traded uh, ETFs here recently, and, you know, that tracks the emerging market space uh, that as we kind of get back in line in the U.S., like that's going to have a direct impact and flow into the, you know, Singapore, Hong Kong, and the rest of Southeast Asia. Okay, thanks. Uh, Vishnu, I have to ask, I mean, I must be fair to everybody and give everybody a chance. So, stock market outlook. Okay. Um, I mean, I'll start off with the ET points. I'm going to leverage off my, my two expert panelists, co-panelists here. Uh, and I'm going to say, yes, um, I, I completely agree that, you know, where we've got all the global supply chains, demand inter uh, interdependency, so on and so forth, S&P 500 would be correlated positively with uh, the equities here. So, so in, in so far that uh, we, we do see the outlook uh, improving once we get peak COVID, and with the amount of liquidity that goes into markets, I mean, these two functions mean that uh, at some point, the S&P 500 is going to move up more durably. Uh, at that point, ASEAN stocks uh, and, and stocks in Asia will follow suit. The real question then is, uh, how is the global liquidity picture being tempered uh, by either fiscal policies or broader policies that then uh, redirect cash flows? So that the point is, there's global liquidity, they're all moving up, but who's going to move up much faster? And that could depend on tax policies as well. If you've got very favorable U.S. tax policies, global liquidity would shift towards the U.S. And in some cases, some Asian stocks might do worse. So the, the, broad, the, the, you know, the, the broad stroke here is once we get past uh, and get some clarity, get past the peak COVID and, and get some clarity, stocks could move up more durably with the liquidity. But I, I don't think it's going to be an even move, uh, particularly in the early stages where we don't see uh, earnings, revenues, and cash flows recovering uh, that quickly. So there's going to be a lag between the markets and, and the markets will have to watch for what could be turning a corner and what might just corner and skid. Okay. All right. V Vishnu, stay, stay there because the next question um, is, is about, I think, the topic that you spoke on um, earlier this morning. Is there a hypothetical risk of China attempting to push back against the hegemony of the US dollar, as they surely can't be happy about the power of the reserve currency. How will it manifest in reality? Good evening. And I'm told as, yeah, yes, you, you spoke about this, didn't you? Or didn't you? As, as you said, I did speak earlier in, in two senses. I, I touched on it earlier. And, and last year, this was the topic. <laughs> uh, so yes. So in, in, in more than one sense, and, and I'll give uh, the, 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 the upshot is this. It is not hypothetical. In an ideal world, China wants to challenge this. Is it a real and uh, present danger at this moment? Is it a real risk now? No, it is not. So it's not hypothetical, but nor is it a risk. And, and the, the, how, how do I expound this answer? It is because even post to, uh, GFC in 2008, China was already kicking up a fuss about dollar volatility, uh, creating a lot of uh, disruptions in the market. And, and, and they were then trying to propose, uh, you know, alternatives to the dollar as the reserve currency. So we've got a whole basket of currencies in, 
uh, in the IMF, if you wish. And, and, and you know, the Romimpi has now been added. So in theory, there's a group of currencies that could be considered reserve currencies, but by far the dominant currency is dollar. And it's got huge network effects, not just from global trade and global asset markets, but also from petrodollars and just in terms of uh, the, the network effects of it. Now, are we able to uh, dislodge this at this point? No. So China can do all that it wants. There are institutional factors as well. So for example, IMF, World Bank are two big institutions that entrench the position of the dollar. So has China started the challenge? Yes, they have already have. AIIB is one example of an institutional factor that's being put in place so that the Romimbi could rise uh, apart from its trade flows. And, and we, we don't get that much trade done in Romimbi anyway, even, if, even though China is a huge trading power. So they are putting in institutional factors, but these are not very quick switches, particularly given that uh, there are so many impediments for, for, for China's case, uh, capital controls or imperfect capital mobility and the uh, inadequacy of its uh, capital markets for, for, for the world to buy Chinese government bonds. The desirability of it or the availability of it, both are lacking. So on, on that basis, I'm going to say, I'm going to reiterate, it's not hypothetical, the challenge has already started but it's just an announcement of the challenge. Uh, is, uh, is there anyone getting close to uh, the dollar? Not quite. Uh, I, I know this is not a good analogy, but uh, the dollar is the Usain Bolt. No one comes close, or at least not, not with the Olympics that we saw. So I'll leave it there. <laughs> yes. Okay, okay, thanks. Um, we've got time for one more question, and, and that one is going to be on the REITs. Um, there's a question here. What do you think, or what does the panel think about the Singapore REITs and the US REITs current situation? For US REITs, I'm going to direct this to you, Chris. I, look, I mean, we, uh, you, know, you know, real estate in general is, is, is something that is going to be something of relative strength. We, but I, we don't really have much, you know, I'm not a REIT specialist by any means. You know, if you talk about sentiment, trade, interest rates, you know, but uh, uh, more around the focus of, you know, as we see economies get stabilized, that, you know, that uh, the real estate sector is generally seen as an area of relative strength, which would help prop up the REITs, not only in the U.S., but should, you know, around uh, Singapore and Southeast Asia, especially because all the central banks have cut rates so much, the money is very cheap to borrow. For the Singapore REITs, can I can I go to you, Nirgunan? Are you there? Nigi, S REITs. Hi hi, how are you doing? Yes, I, I I'm fine. I'm asking you. Do you have a, a view on how well or badly the S REITs will do now that? Uh, the MAS has raised their gearing ratio to 50% and uh, deferred the ICR. That was uh, going to be troublesome for uh, some of about, I think about seven or eight weeks and um, deferred the, yes. the tax transparency. Yes. Mm. Um, certainly in a, in an environment where the interest rates in the United States are going to be lower, uh, S streets, would uh, on principle look more attractive. However, you need to be quite discerning. There are some categories within the S REIT asset class that would be especially vulnerable. For example, the mall REITs, uh, the commercial REITs. However, the others which would have a, an even stronger model in the post COVID-19 era include the data center REITs. So those are ones which uh, people may view more favorably. So certainly REITs in general may uh, seem attractive overall, but within it, one needs to be fairly discerning. Okay, thanks. I think that's about um, all we have uh, time for. For the beneficiaries of the, of the raising of the gearing limit, I think our, our attendees may want to uh, tune into the next issue of, of The Edge, uh, maybe for the uh, last week of, of April. Um, and I think with that, uh, thank you for all tuning in and thank you very much for our speakers and uh, have a very good uh, weekend. Thank you.
Take care, guys. Bye. Thank you, gentlemen. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Gula. That was uh, really well uh, compared. So well done. Oh, thanks. Thank you, Nikki. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Wow, what a way to start the morning. Thank you to Chris, Vishnu, Nagunan, Gula, and you for joining us this morning at Virus Oil and Politics, a volatile mix. This webinar was brought to you by the H Singapore and sponsored by TD Ameritrade Singapore. We will be sending a feedback survey to you shortly. Our webinar slides and recording will be sent to those who participate in the survey. Stay home, stay safe, and have a great weekend.